And welcome back to You Reach Out at 120. I'm Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Regina as part of a computer science degree. And today we're going to be talking about kind of one of the other great minds of human history, uh, the reason that I'm able to get a computer science degree, which is, of course, St. Alan Turing, uh, which is, of course, the uh, person who broke the Enigma code, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, just to give some context, so after uh, Lady Ada and Charles Babbage started things off, there was kind of a lull. As I mentioned, they weren't really funded nearly to the extent that they would have needed to be to build a mechanical computing device. The analytical engine wasn't funded, and there wasn't really a need for that much computing power, uh, at least until the Second World War, relative to other things that could have been invested in, such as public sewer systems. And so while uh, that was going on in England, uh, Germany was kind of at the height of development for information technology uh, with IBM's data processing machines, uh, the Enigma machine, and even a, an actual computer uh, from Konrad Zuse. Uh, there, in Germany, there was a lot of technology, there was a lot of industrial uh, means available, uh, and so when the world went to war and the kind of United States, Canada, Britain, uh, in France, went to war against Germany. Uh, Germany had actually a, a fair bit of an edge as far as uh, technology and information uh, technology went. Uh, and e even going back kind of as far as 1930 and 1931, uh, we, we can look at the, of course, German, uh, or, you know, Gödel uh, and, and his results uh, kind of about the Principia Mathematica uh, being either complete or inconsistent, which, again, you don't have to kind of understand the full context of what that means, but uh, this was something that was happening in Germany at the time. Uh, it was, it was the, the intellectual world and thinking about uh, information systems was kind of revolving around that. And by about 1933, Alan Turing read that uh, Principia, and uh, he had kind of encountered by about 1935, uh, if I'm pronouncing this right, because again, it's a German word, Anscheidens problem uh, lay open, uh, which uh, up until that point uh, was kind of one of the more important mathematical problems of the day. Uh, and so Turing was kind of interested in making geared machines that were more and more general purpose, kind of following the same path that Lady Ada and Charles, ba Charles Babbage kind of had followed. Uh, specifically, he was trying to kind of look into one that was capable of calculating the Riemann zeta function. Uh, which again is, is not strictly speaking necessary that you understand what that is or how it works, but just it's a complicated mathematical function. You can kind of imagine that if you were doing it all by hand on paper and pencil, uh, eventually this is going to be involve a lot of work, a lot of busy work especially, and so people are going to want to automate this, and this is going to be one of the things that he's going to be interested in doing. And so uh, he, he's kind of involved with that, uh, he's attending classes by uh, such brilliant people as Wittgenstein. Uh, as a grad student, he had, uh, kind of had his chance and addressed this, again, if I'm pronouncing it right, on Scheidens problem, uh, by coming up with this concept of a Turing machine, uh, which he wasn't the only person addressing that problem at the time. Alonzo Church was also addressing it. Uh, they both kind of resolved the issue or, or approached the issue in the same way uh, but even Church figures, because of this Turing machine idea, uh, Turing had the uh, kind of upper hand because it's a little bit more obvious of a solution uh, and a, a proof because of it. And before I get kind of into how that works, the idea of a Turing machine, which you kind of can see pictured behind us, uh, is that you have this paper tape, and it doesn't literally have to be a paper tape, but it can be something that works like a paper tape, uh, with symbols on it. And this machine uh, is at any given point looking at one of the symbols. The machine has an internal state. The machine can read and write on this paper tape. It can erase symbols. It can add symbols. Uh, you can view it purely in terms of either ones and zeros if you want. Uh, or you can have any alphabet, uh, it really doesn't matter. All that matters is you have this machine that at any given point it has, it is kind of pointing at or is looking at uh, one part of a paper tape, uh, and that, that paper tape has a finite number of symbols that uh, can be kind of used with it, 
Uh, it remembers some of those symbols, and depending what its internal state is, determines what it does next. So it can either move this along this tape, left or right. Uh, it can change the symbol that's there. Uh, it can stop. It can halt. Uh, that's one of the things that it can do. Uh, and it can start processing, so it can kind of start moving around. But its, it's movement, its, its functionality is going to be based on its state and what's on the tape. Uh, and this is going to be kind of how this machine works. And this may seem like a simple idea, this, this Turing machine thing, this, this uh, imaginary uh, thing on, on a, something like a paper tape. But because it's so simple to understand, it, it, possible to use it to model uh, mathematical uh, problems, mathematical statements. You can write uh, a, 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 a paper tape uh, that, as long as it works with rules encoded uh, in its own state, uh, you can make it output such things as the Riemann zeta function values. Uh, again, as long as you can go from uh, these ones and zeros to a number, which again, is something that is certainly possible to do, and Turing would have found a way to do that. Uh, and But in general, th this turns out to be a very useful thing uh, for, for kind of solving this problem. And uh, in particular, uh, it allows us to uh, come up with something that we would kind of call the halting problem, which is that it the question of, is there a way to know whether a you know, all tapes uh, are will will cause this machine to stop or to halt, uh, and the the answer is no. There there is no general program that we could write, no internal state that we could give one of these machines that would allow it to know whether all uh, whether a an arbitrary um, program given to it and an arbitrary series of instructions would cause it to halt. Uh, so, for example. Uh, looking at it on a broader level, because you can map any computer activity to the activity of one of these machines, that means when you're using a desktop and you, you know, you, you notice that your web browser has crashed, um, one of the things you may say is, well, why can't we just make a program to check whether, you know, a website is going to cause my, my web browser to crash and then not load it if, if that's the case? Uh, well, it may, there, there's kind of a, a caveat there that depends on uh, you know, your computer is not like this because uh, there, there's kind of um, a, 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 a variant uh, in, in of importance here that this paper tape can be infinitely long, um, which of course your computer doesn't have an infinite number of memory. Uh, but ignoring that as a side issue, uh, writing this, this ability for your web browser to detect its own, uh, I guess, crashes is exactly reducible to this halting problem. So uh, you're only going to be able to come up with a, a, an approximation. Uh, you're only going to be able to have some crashes detected, and not all crashes. So the, the, the question of, you know, can we prevent all crashes is actually an impossible one to solve. And this is the guy who figured out that that is the case. So while that's going on, uh, of course, World War II starts. The Germans and their kind of advanced uh, IT uh, supply uh, are, are going to come up in direct military conflict with the United Kingdom. Uh, Turing is going to be brought to Bletchley Park to work on code breaking. Uh, there's actually apparently a movie that was made about this uh, fairly recently. That I've heard that the movie is fairly accurate. Uh, the only thing that they've really gotten wrong is that Turing himself was fairly soft-spoken, and you know Hollywood kind of made him out to be this really loud, you know, loudmouth, heroic person. Uh, that was constantly yelling at people when the stakes were raised. There's no evidence that I'm aware of that Turing was actually like that in person. But otherwise, the, the basic plot, you know, is fairly accurate. Otherwise, uh, he improved on Polish mathematicians' methods for breaking the Enigma code and was crucial for winning the Battle of the Atlantic, in effect ending World War II in Europe and making possible the end of World War II uh, and the dedication of more resources to the Manhattan Project. Uh, and for even making uh, as much of an inroads in the Cold War as the United States and England made. Um, part of how he did this, part of what he did uh, to 
break the enigma involves, and going back to uh, another video here, the proof by contradiction. Uh, quote, he had the idea that you could use, in effect, a theorem in logic which sounds to the untrained ear rather absurd, namely that from a contradiction you can deduce everything. Unquote. So this is actually directly related to how he solved the Enigma code problem. Uh, I don't want to go into too much details on that, but it's just worth kind of noting that uh, this is how he did it, or, or one of the ways that he did it. Uh, and it's worth also pointing out that unlike with Lady Ada and Charles Babbage, the UK government did fund Turing. Uh, Turing and his peers w wrote directly to Winston Churchill spelling out what they could do for a pittance of money compared to the general war effort, and from that letter they got pretty much whatever they asked for, uh, and the dividends from that were huge, so the UK definitely got their money's worth on that one. Uh, the other uh, thing, other than the uh, proof by contradiction uh, that's wor worth pointing out, uh, is that Turing was actually, uh, he used Bayesian statistics. And uh, it was even secret for many years that he had done so. Uh, but he brought a Bayesian statistics to cryptanalysis. Uh, and to apparently, this is something that I didn't, didn't even know until I was doing the research for this video. But apparently, there are two, two of Turing's papers, quote, the applications of probability to cryptography and a paper on statistics of re repetitions were not released to the public until 2012. This is actually after I, in fact, got my degree. So this is something that has come out even recently, that 70 years practically in the past, uh, Turing was already kind of ahead of the game uh, as far as using Bayes' rule uh, and uh, Bayes' results uh, for, for code breaking. Uh, so uh, what, what other than the, the Turing machine, what did Turing give us? Uh, well, first is that he provided a proof of concept that computers actually work in practice that you could actually build, although they were expensive, they took up a lot of room, ate a lot of electricity, uh, consumed a lot of you know, power and heat and stuff like that, they worked and they could actually solve real problems and problems outside of the realm of pure mathematics. And that they were had a potential for all sorts of things that was now immediately apparent to people in power uh, who then started to fund you know, research and development into them and start funneling money into them. We are all in his debt for his doing so because he was the guy who started this computer revolution uh, in, er in earnest. Uh, for his work, the Association of Computing Machinery awards a Turing Award uh, every, I think, I think it's every year, uh, but in any case, it's basically the equivalent of a Nobel Prize in computer science. So if you hear of someone who's won the Turing Award, this guy has actually done some really important stuff. Uh, and of course, Turing himself uh, has started this whole uh, thing in general. He came up with the idea of Turing oracles, uh, which are basically ways of representing uh, a machine or, or a source of giving example, or a source of giving information that isn't directly uh, modelable in and of itself. Uh, this allows us to basically look at problems where we may not be able to figure out how something is done, but then we can use kind of sub parts of that problem uh, to understand the nature of the problem itself. Quote, an oracle is infinitely more powerful than anything a modern computer can do, and nothing like an elementary component of a computer, unquote. Yet nevertheless, even with these oracles, there are problems that we know about uh, that are still unsolvable and are still... Uh, you, you can build partial solutions to them with oracles alone, but even then, the, the whole of the solution uh, kind of eludes us. So it kind of shows us what we don't know, uh, and things that we don't know are, are valuable when we know about them. So uh, he also came up with the ideas of neural networks and genetic algorithms long before they could even be implemented by actual computers. Uh, he came up with the idea of the Turing test uh, in his computing machinery and intelligence. Computing Machinery and Intelligence article, uh, which has, a, a, among other things, a direct uh, impact on our life because of the CAPTCHAs that we all solve when using websites to this day. Uh, he also made possible uh, the view of what it would take to judge a Turing test. Uh, uh, Roto, uh, kind of a friend of mine, came up, uh, kind of mentioned the idea that it should be possible, or, or the, the really hard problem is writing the program to judge the Turing test. And of course, that's a problem that would never have come up without, of course, Turing coming up with the original Turing test idea. 
Uh, he helped Bell Labs develop the secure speech technologies, uh, kind of a crypto applied to phone conversations. Uh, he helped develop the Colossus and Mark I computers, some of the earliest electronic computers in existence, along with, by that point, Conrad Zuse. Uh, he wrote a chess program, probably the first chess program ever written, uh, which wasn't great, but it was good enough to beat the wife of one of his peers, uh, and made major advances in linear algebra and biology, as well as other fields. And there's no doubt that there's still probably some of his works that are hidden from us by the GHCQ and the other Five Eyes. Uh, by the end of his life, he was starting, as kind of mentioned, he was starting to get into biology. Uh, and realistically, the, he started the modern revolution in biology by investigating morphogenesis and how patterns that we observe in living things could be generated. So he's really one of the people responsible for turning biology itself from a descriptive science and a science that had uh, was kind of stuck in the Baconian level of just kind of collecting data and describing it towards actually using biology as a tool, uh, kind of taking steps towards uh, being able to control how biology itself works. This, he's related to other videos we've taken so far, uh, including the forest versus trees video, because turning design gear systems, like old mechanical typewriter style calculators, and had to learn how to use telephone relays and other simple, util, simple tools. So he was really uh, knowledgeable about the low level stuff. But nevertheless, he had access to, uh, at least in his thoughts, uh, some of the highest order things yet developed uh, by mankind. And he never gave up his fascination with the high level. But he was willing and able to work with everything in between, at least that was available to him. Uh, so he was, because of his position at Bletchley Park, kind of responsible for the full stack. So that this is someone who would not have been afraid of stepping in on any part of the stack, kind of working to solve problems within it. Uh, it's related to the Great White Combine video, because uh, Turing was a, a, a homosexual. And wha what happened to him is one of the great tragedies of our history, uh, because he was charged for being just a homosexual, uh, and ended up committing suicide, or at least apparently committing suicide. There's some de debate on that. But regardless, uh, he was he was faced with this, this great uh, barrier because of who he was and how he was born. And we have lost so much because his, he did not have the ability to, to live a longer life, uh, a life that would have been much simpler had we accepted him for who he was, instead of having the, the UK government force him to be drugged, uh, force him to uh, kind of uh, lose his security clearance, lose his access to computers, lose his access to the tools that he had designed, uh, and you know, in general, we, we have lost a great deal because of what was taken from him for the mere fact that he was a homosexual. Uh, to her credit, Queen Elizabeth pardoned Turing many, many years after the fact, uh, and certainly long after he was dead. Um, but even so, he was filtered out. There was this great filter that kind of took him out and all the progress that he was making kind of stopped because of what? Because of our prejudices, because of our cultural barbarity, uh, and what have we lost because, because of it? Uh, he's related to the NAND uh, video because much of what he worked with were in fact NAND games. On the low, low enough level, uh, those telephone relays that he was working with uh, a lot of the times were NAND gates in practice. And so when, even especially when dealing with neural networks uh, and what he was calling organ unorganized machines, uh, he was thinking about these th things in terms of NAND gates. Uh, so if it was good enough for Alan Turing's purposes, you know, you, know, you only really need this, this kind of a vision of a Turing machine, a NAND gate, and you can practically replicate everything that he did and take steps beyond where he was able to get, again, because he was filtered out before he was able to dedicate his mind to the problem. Uh, there is a burden of proof problem, going back to the burden of proof video, uh, inherent in intelligence and in describing intelligence, uh, in that we don't really have a clear understanding, uh, and we certainly didn't have a clear understanding when Alan Turing approached the problem of what is intelligence, and how can we kind of tease details of how it works out. Uh, and so his setting up of the Turing test, uh, is kind of part of the attempt at clarifying, clarifying what the burden of proof would mean in describing how intelligence works, how the human brain works. And in general, it's, 
he took steps towards making artificial intelligence a area of serious academic study. Uh, he was the one who brought up intelligence as a topic, a, as a thing that could be approached, and we all are in his debt for his doing so. Of course, uh, Ben Cerf uh, and his internet would have been impossible without computers that were well-funded and computer installations that were well-funded and well-understood in many parts of the world waiting to be connected. And so the internet itself, again, would not have existed if not for Alan Turing's kind of raising the level of respectability of computers and making a w the rest of us aware that computers could work. Uh, connecting those computers was the next step, but it had to follow the existence and, and manufacture of those computers themselves. Uh, going back to the pragmatism video, the concept of turning intelligence into something actionable, uh, into something that we can understand and use and kind of build parts of, that was something that he would have been part of, uh, and so on. And kind of as normal with these videos, normally I kind of have like a little Bitcoin address in the bottom here where you can donate to support them. But again, Bitcoin it is a system, is purely considered and constructed in the terms of machines that are modelable on Turing machines. If we think about what Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is the idea of money being kind of designed from the context of what it would mean to be money if money took place on the output of these Turing machines. As a kind of side note, uh, he's also a runner and a cyclist, and uh, if not for a fairly minor injury, uh, would probably have made the 1948 Olympic running team uh, for England. Uh, and uh, he made uh, runs pretty much constantly from London to Bletchley Park. Uh, and if I live long enough, and if I am able to physically do so, I would love to, to kind of make that trip. I, I, I don't know, I, I'd like to know, it. maybe somebody, uh, if you uh, know somebody uh, who is in England, uh, is the, the path marked? Because I think it should be. Uh, he made a huge uh, kind of advance uh, towards our understanding of the universe, our understanding of ourselves. Uh, this is a hero for humanity. Uh, the path that he ran every day or every you know, couple of days, that is, that is an important thing that should be marked. Uh, let, let me know if it actually is. I haven't been able to find out one way or the other. But again, I'd love to, I'd love to run it uh, personally. Uh, and I, I, I'll kind of close this video with a quote uh, from Turing himself uh, on programming as he kind of viewed it, uh, which at, at the time was a very primitive thing. It involved a lot of constructing of instruction tables and lists of numbers. But, quote, the process of constructing instruction tables should be very fascinating. Uh, there need be no real danger of it ever becoming a drudge, for any process which or that are quite mechanical may be turned over to the machine itself." Unquote. So this is th from the perspective of the guy who's you know, got his nose down, solving the most important crypto problem of the day, uh, and it's not boring for him. It is not something that he has to do because it's just work. That mechanical, that repetitive, that kind of boring work is exactly the kind of work that he is feeding into his machines to do for him. He's keeping for himself the interesting work, the fascinating work, that's the, the work that keeps you up all night, the stuff that makes your life worth living. That is the things that he would keep for humans to do. Uh, and the, the hard work, the drudgery, the, the kind of boring stuff, that's the stuff that he wants to get rid of. So that is, of course, Alan Turing, as I would refer to as Saint Alan Turing, for his remarkable impact on humanity and his bringing us up to the point where we can accomplish so so much more. If you have any questions, or if you'd like to describe, or if you'd like me to describe some of the things I've mentioned, kind of in passing in this video, there's a lot of things that he's kind of delved in. Uh, for example, Turing tests. Uh, but if you're if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, certainly let me know. Um, I will answer any questions you guys have. Um, is there any questions from the audience today? No questions? Okay. Uh, and as usual, uh, you know, use these, these tools that Turing has given us. Uh, we can only uh, kind of advance to the extent that we're able to make the best use possible. Uh, and uh, I will see you in the next video.